Welcome back. This is the second session dealing with the mechanics of breathing. You'll recall that in the last session we talked about the pressure volume behavior of the lung and chest wall. And now we move to, and that's sometimes called statics, and now we're going to move to the movement of gas in the lung and particularly the important topic of airway resistance and this is sometimes called dynamics. And to introduce this we first need to look at airflow through tubes and these, this is shown in this image here. Now if we have a, a, a tube in which the uh, a, a tube for which gas is flowing at a relatively low, uh, slow rate, we have what's called laminar flow. In laminar flow, all the particles of the gas are moving parallel to the sides of the tube, so it's a very well-behaved system of flow. Of course, the pressure at the upstream end of the tube has to be greater than the pressure at the downstream end, otherwise there's no flow. Now, if we increase the flow rate, we may reach a point where the flow becomes what's called transitional. And this is particularly seen where the tube divides into two daughter branches, as shown here. There's laminar flow in the upper part, the original part of the tube here, but then you get flow separation, eddy formation, particularly at the uh, junction here of the, uh, the, where the, the tube divides and this is called transitional flow. If you increase the flow rate even more, then the movement of the gas becomes random. You get turbulence, and that's a different kind of flow. It occurs at very high flow rates. Now, the principles of laminar flow were worked out by, oddly enough, by a French physician called Poisset. He was very interested in blood flow through blood vessels, and he became so interested in that that he began to work on the fluid dynamics of flow, and he put out this equation, the Poisset equation, for laminar flow, which is very important. And you can see that it says that the flow in liters per minute or whatever you like is equal to the difference of pressure between the two ends of the tubes, delta P times pi, times the radius to the fourth power divided by a constant eight, the viscosity eta and the length of the tube L. So you can see that flow is proportional to the pressure difference. It's inversely proportional to the viscosity and to the length, and it depends on the fourth power of the radius. Now the resistance is given by the delta P, the difference in pressure divided by the flow. You recall that we talked about that when we were uh, discussing the bl blood flow through the lung. And so from this we can calculate the resistance, derive it as 8 times viscosity times length over pi r to the fourth. Now that's interesting. It's not surprising that the resistance is proportional to the viscosity. The higher the viscosity, the greater the resistance to flow. Not surprising that it's uh, proportional to the length of the tube. The longer the tube, the higher the resistance. What is remarkable is that the resistance is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius. What that means is that if you halve the tube, the resistance increases 16-fold. So there's an extraordinary sensitivity to the radius of the tube. And that is very important in diseases like asthma, where the tubes narrow, the airways narrow, and uh, of course the resistance to breathing increases tremendously. So the Poisset equation for laminar flow has some very important consequences. Now, as I said, you can have laminar flow at low flow rates, transitional, then occurs at slightly higher flow rates, and at much higher flow rates you get turbulent flow. And it's probable that the, uh, and, and there are various features of laminar flow that I should mention. One is that in fully developed laminar flow, the flow rate in the center of the tube is much higher than the flow rate elsewhere. In fact, you've got what's called a velocity profile uh, 
which turns out to be a parabola, and the flow rate in the center of the tube is actually twice the mean flow rate. So you've got this spike of flow going down the center of the tube. The, um, this is not the case with turbulent flow. With turbulent flow, you get a much flatter velocity profile, whereas in laminar flow, the flow is proportional to the pressure difference between two ends of the tube, but in turbulence, the flow is uh, proportional to uh, the square of the pressure difference, or something like that. Now, whether flow is turbulent or laminar depends on the Reynolds number, as shown here. Reynolds number has radius, velocity, and density in the numerator, and viscosity in the denominator, as you can see here. And if you've got long, smooth tubes of uniform diameter, the flow is likely to be, to be turbulent if the Reynolds number exceeds about 2,000. Actually, if you look at the Reynolds number, what it's saying is that the Reynolds number is proportional to the inertial component, that's the velocity times the density, divided by the viscous component. So if you've got a high density gas, you're more likely to get turbulent flow. If you've got a very viscous gas, you're very likely to get laminar flow. Now, what's all this, to, what, what's all this have to do with flow in the airways of the lung? Well, the airways of the lung are a complicated structure, as we've seen. The airways branch repeatedly. They change their caliber with inspiration and expiration. Flow rate changes during inspiration and expiration. And so it's a complicated situation. It's probable that in most of the airways of the human lung, the flow is transitional, but that in the very small airways where the Reynolds number becomes very low, flow is truly laminar. Probably in the trachea, certainly during exercise, flow is probably turbulent. So um, the, the situation in the human lung is, is a little bit complicated, but it's important to understand the factors determining the type of flow. And in particular, important to realize the importance in laminar flow of the radius and the fact that the resistance is inversely proportional to the fourth power. Now let's turn to the pressures and flows during the breathing cycle. And initially this uh, may look rather daunting, but we can go through it uh, slowly and it actually encapsulates a lot of useful information. What we've got here is a subject breathing into a spirometer, which is giving us the volume during inspiration and expiration. We also have a flow meter in the airway here. That's a, a wire screen and we measure the pressure difference across it. It has laminar flow going through it because it's a wire screen and we, from that we can get the flow rate. We can't measure the intrapleural pressure in a subject, but you recall that we can measure the pressure in the esophagus with a small balloon, and that is a good indication of intrapleural pressure. And we can't directly measure alveolar pressure, although we can infer this from the, the body box. You remember the body plethysmograph that we talked about in the session on ventilation. So let's see what happens here. The subject takes an inspiration, and in this case, inspiration is downward. And at the end of inspiration, he stops breathing in, and then he has an expiration. So the plot of volume against time, of course, is relatively simple. That's no, no problem there. Now let's drop down to the third panel here and look at the flow. Well, as you can see, flow is zero at the beginning of inspiration, zero. But with inspiratory flow, insp as the volume increases, flow increases, of course, and shown here. In fact, the flow is maximal uh, here, and then at the end of inspiration, flow falls to zero. Then during expiration, flow increases initially, reaches a peak, then falls to zero again. In fact, if you've got a mathematical turn of mind, you may notice that the flow rate is simply the slope of the volume tracing here. It's actually the, uh, 
derivative of volume with respect to time. And we could, in fact, measure the flow rate by taking the derivative of volume, but it's actually better in practice to use a flow meter, which was what we're doing here. So the volume and flow patterns are, are really quite simple. Let's look now at alveolar pressure. Now, for flow to start during inspiration, alveolar pressure has to fall. Remember that if there's no pressure difference between two ends of a tube, there's no flow. So in order for inspiratory flow to begin, alveolar pressure has to fall, and that's shown here. Uh, it falls uh, and has a maximum during the middle of inspiration, and then falls to zero again at the end of inspiration. And then during expiration, alveolar pressure has to rise above atmospheric pressure and falls again to zero. Now, what about the shape of the alveolar pressure curve? Well, if the resistance during breathing is constant, and it very nearly is during this normal tidal breathing that we're considering here, then the alveolar pressure tracing is going to be a reflection of the flow tracing because flow is proportional to the pressure difference if there, the resistance is constant. So here we've shown the alveolar pressure tracing as a mirror image of the flow tracing here. So that's not particularly difficult. The only panel that is a little more challenging is intrapleural pressure. Now let's first of all consider that when the volume of the lung is increased, the static recoil pressure of the lung rises. In other words, it gets more difficult to expand the lung. And therefore, the intrapleural pressure falls along this broken line here. And then with expiration, the intrapleural pressure becomes less negative because the recoil forces of the lung are less at a lower volume. So it returns, like as shown here. And if the compliance of the lung is constant during this relatively small excursion of volume, which it very nearly is, then this curve, ABC, the broken line here, will be a mirror image of the volume curve. They'll be the same, and that's what's shown here. So that's the intrapleural pressure falling and then rising again because of the change in lung volume, because you need a certain pressure to expand the lung. But intrapleural pressure falls for an additional reason, and that is because alveolar pressure falls. And in fact, the, the uh, shaded area here indicates the additional fall in intrapleural pressure caused by the fall in alveolar pressure. And so alveolar pressure falls along the line A, B prime C, and the solid line going back here again. And you'll notice that the vertical distance here, that's the additional pressure required, is the same as alveolar pressure here. So it's important to realize that intrapleural pressure during inspiration falls for two reasons. One is the increased lung volume and therefore the increased static recoil force of the lung. And the second is the fall in intrapleural pressure, which is necessary for flow to occur. During expiration, alveolar pressure rises, as you can see. And actually, during a forced expiration, alveolar pressure may rise so much that intrapleural pressure exceeds atmospheric pressure. OK, so those are the pressures and the flows during the breathing cycle, a little bit complicated initially, but very important to understand because, you know, when we are ventilating a patient in the intensive care unit with a mechanical ventilator, we've got to understand all the factors involved. Now let's talk about the factors involving uh, determining airway resistance. And the first factor you might, the first question I, I'm going to ask is, which airways in the lung do you think contribute most to airway resistance? Well, now, we've just been talking about the Poisset relationship with the radius to the fourth term, and you might well say, well, surely the smallest airways in the lung contribute most of the airway resistance. And indeed, this is what was thought until relatively recently. But it turns out that's not the case. And the reason why it's not the case is shown here. It turns out that the number of airways at each generation 
increases very rapidly as we go down the line. Here's a plot showing the number of airways, and this is from the Weibel model that we talked about, uh, we've talked about several times now. This shows the number of airways for each airway generation. Trachea, which would be down here somewhere, has, uh, would be one airway and, and, and so on. Two airways for the right and left main bronchi and so on. And you can see that after we get to generation, what, 11 or 12 or so, there's a very rapid increase in the number of airways. In fact, in the, at the, the level of the terminal bronchioles, there are something like 50,000 airways in the lung, tremendous number of terminal bronchioles. Again, those of you with a mathematical turn of mind may see that really all we're saying here is that the number of airways is equal to 2 times the uh, 2 to the power n, where n is the airway generation, because each airway divides into two daughter airways. Uh, the airways undergo dichotomous branching, as it's called. At any event, don't worry about that. The important thing is that there is a very large number of very small airways. That means that although each airway has a high resistance because of its small radius, the fact that you're sharing the resistance over this very large number of airways means that the resistance of the very small airways is actually quite small. And this plot shows the resistance of the each generation as we go from the trachea up here right down to the uh, terminal bronchioles down here. And you can see, as you might not expect, and certainly it was a bit of a surprise actually when this was shown experimentally, most of the resistance is in the medium-sized airways. And actually the very small airways down here contribute a very small amount of the resistance. Remember I said there were something like 50,000 terminal, more than 50,000 terminal bronchioles and these, this region contributes very little resistance. This has important implications. This region of the lung where the resistance is small in, in the small airways here is sometimes called a silent zone. And the reason it's given that name is that it's difficult to pick up changes in resistance in this region of the lung. We would like to do that because we believe that many of the changes in early disease, early airways disease, occur in the small airways. In fact, you rem may remember we've referred to this in the past, the fact that pollutants tend to deposit in the small airways, uh, and the reason for that is that they have a very slow diffusion and they can't diffuse to the terminal alveoli because of their high mass, these uh, pollutant particles, they tend to deposit in the region of the terminal and respiratory bronchioles, and we would dearly like to have a method of determining whether the airway resistance increases in mild disease, but it's very difficult to measure that because the intrinsic resistance of these airways is so small that this region constitutes a silent zone and we're not able to measure the, the, uh, the, the pressure in it. Now, other factors increase airway resistance and uh, one of the most important is lung volume. It turns out that airway resistance, shown here as AWR, decreases as lung volume increases. Now why should that be? That's simply because the airways are tethered by the alveoli and they are pulled open by the radial traction of the alveoli as the lung is expanded. Actually, you can see that if you look down into the lung with a bronchoscope, a bronchoscope is a tube that you push down into the lung, into the large airways, and you can, you can see the airways, you can see them expanding as the lung, as the patient inhales, and they decrease their caliber as the patient exhales. And actually, this may remind you of the extra alveolar blood vessels, which are pulled open for the same reason. The extra alveolar blood vessels and the airways are pulled open by the radial traction of the lung parenchyma, the fact that as you expand the lung, the tension in the alveolar walls increases and the lung exp as the lung expands, and that's why the airway resistance falls with increasing lung volume. Sometimes people 
refer to the resistance, they, they use another term called the conductance, which is simply the, the inverse of resistance, and it happens that this has an almost linear relationship with lung volume. The change in airway resistance to lung volume is very important. For one thing, it's important that we, that we know what lung volume we're working at if we measure airway resistance. And it's also important in understanding why patients with severe lung disease breathe at a high lung volume. They breathe at a high lung volume because their resistance is less under those conditions. In fact, a patient with severe uh, chronic obstructive lung disease could not possibly stay alive breathing at a normal volume because the resistance would be too great. So they tend to breathe with a high lung volume. Other factors affect airway resistance. The, the bronchial smooth muscle, the smooth muscle in the airway walls, is uh, controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And adrenergic stimulation dilates the airways. There are both beta-1 and beta-2 adrenergic receptors. The beta-1 receptors are mainly in the heart. Beta-2 receptors are in the airways. And if you stimulate these, you can get relaxation. You can get an increase in caliber of the airways. And so beta-2 adrenergic receptor drugs are very important in the treatment of asthma, for example. They, they are extremely important uh, part of the armamentarium for treating uh, airway disease. Other factors also affect airway resistance. Uh, there can be a reflex constriction of airways, and we're going to be talking about that more when we look at the control of ventilation. But, for example, if people inhale cigarette smoke, there's a reflex constriction of airways, which uh, uh, occurs. And um, also, another factor affecting airway resistance is the density of the gas. You remember that in, in turbulent flow, density is one of the factors, not in laminar flow, interestingly enough, but in turbulent flow, density is one of the factors. And for example, a diver who goes down, scuba diver for example, and some of you may be scuba divers, will know that when you go down deep into the water, the density of the gas the increase in density of the gas causes increased work of breathing. It's more, more difficult to move the gas. And professional divers, for example, will use uh, a helium oxygen mixture uh, because that tends to, uh, that reduces the work of breathing. Uh, and so uh, density is an important thing. And actually, a helium oxygen mixture has been used sometimes in the treatment of patients with lung disease. Okay, so those are some of the factors influencing airway resistance, which from a clinical point of view is a very important topic. Now I'm going to move to a very important uh, topic, and that is what we call dynamic compression of the airways. Uh, it's very important because it's responsible for much of the disability of patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, it's initially not an easy topic to understand. In fact, uh, it's only recently been fully worked out, but it's desperately important, and so I'm going to spend some time on it. Now, suppose we have a subject here who is breathing into a spirometer, as we can see, and we're measuring the volume from the spirometer, and we're also measuring the flow from the flow rate. As I said before, we can actually uh, we can use the, the, the differential of the volume signal uh, as flow, but it's, it's better actually to measure flow directly, and that's what we're doing here. So we ask this subject to breathe in as far as he can to total lung capacity. Okay, that's the, that's the largest volume you can get in the lung with a maximal inspiration. And then we ask him to exhale all the way to residual volume till he can't get any more air out of his lung. And initially, we ask him to do that with the most effort that he can. A breathe out as hard and as fast as he can from total lung capacity to residual volume. And we get a curve shown like this. Flow rises rapidly to a very high level and then declines, as you can see, over most of the expiration down to zero flow at residual volume. 
Now this flow volume curve, or flow volume envelope as you, as you want, might want to call it, is extremely interesting because it turns out that it's very difficult to get outside it, to, to exceed it. For example, suppose we ask somebody to take, to take in a full breath and then we asked him not to make a maximal expiration but to breathe out at a relatively high degree of effort but not maximal, then what we find is curve C here. Uh, he, the flow rate increases of course but not so much because he's not trying so hard to breathe out but during most of the curve the flow rate travels down exactly the same path. Even more surprising perhaps is if we ask somebody to take in a full breath and just breathe out rather leisurely during the first part of the expiration and then accelerate and breathe out as hard as he can. Again, remarkably, the flow rate increases to this envelope shown here and then decreases down the same path. So we can perhaps uh, we can think that a couple of, of things uh, come from this. One is that something that uh, something is limiting flow rate in this region of the flow volume curve because we can't apparently get over get past it. And the second thing that we might uh, indicate is that flow rate is relatively effort independent because no matter how hard you try, you can't exceed this flow for a given volume. Now the reasons for this can be clarified on the next image and this is a little bit complicated initially. Uh, the important thing to realize about this image is that these curves here are not obtained from single expirations. The way these are obtained is that you have a patient during a series of expirations and inspirations as a matter of fact and you measure the flow rate and the intrapleural pressure at different stages of the inspiration. Okay? And that's how you generate these curves. These are not single curves like I showed in the previous slide. And these are sometimes called isovolume pressure flow curves because they're curves plotted for particular volumes. A high lung volume here, mid vol volume here, and a low lung volume here. So let's look first of all at this part of the slide here. This is for inspiration. Inspiration down here. And we can see that, uh, that the harder you inspire, the lower the intrapleural pressure, the higher the flow rate. Okay, here's flow along here intrapleural pressure along here. The harder you inspire, the, if you reduce your inspiratory pressure to minus 15 centimeters water, for example, the higher the inspiratory flow rate. And that's what you'd expect. It would, you'd expect that the, the more you try to inhale, the, the faster the air is pulled into the lung. And that's also true of expiration at a high lung volume. At a high lung volume, you can see that the higher you raise the intrapleural pressure, shown down here, the higher the expiratory flow rate. So that, that is also expected. But look at what happens at mid-volume here. Something very peculiar happens. As you increase the intrapleural pressure during exhalation, initially the flow rate increases a bit, but then it remains absolutely constant. In other words, what we're saying here is that no matter how much you increase your intrapleural pressure, no, much, no, no matter how much you, you try to exhale, you, you uh, contract your expiratory muscles, mainly the, the uh, abdominal muscles, no matter how much you try to inhale, you can't raise the flow rate. And that's even more striking at a low lung volume. Look at the low lung volume here over almost all of the expiration, the flow rate is independent of the intrapleural pressure. So what we're saying here is that during much of expiration, expiratory flow is independent of effort. Very interesting. What's the reason for that? Well, this shows some of the reasons for that. And the best way to look at it 
is we'll take it in steps. Let's start with pre-inspiration here. What we're showing is very diagrammatically, this is the chest cage here. This is the airway here, the alveolus here. And pre-inspiration, where we're at FRC and the intrapleural pressure shown here is about, say, minus five centimeters of water. That's a reasonable value. Pre-inspiration, no airflow, and therefore the pressure throughout the airways is going to be atmospheric pressure, shown here as zero. So the mouth pressure here, alveolar pressure here, and pressure somewhere in the airways also shown as atmospheric. Very important point, when there's no flow, there's no pressure difference, okay? Now let's start inspiring. In order to start to inspire, intrapleural pressure has got to fall, okay? We make an inspiratory effort, and alveolar pressure falls. If alveolar pressure doesn't fall, of course, there's no flow. How much does alveolar pressure fall in relation to intrapleural pressure? Well, let's assume that we're looking at the events at the beginning of inspiration, before lung volume has changed uh, appreciably. The difference between alveolar and intrapleural pressure must be the same as it is here. Remember we said uh, in the last session that, that, the, that the transpulmonary pressure, the difference between alveolar pressure and intrapleural pressure depends on lung volume. So if lung volume hasn't changed at the beginning of inspiration here, just at the beginning, then we know that, that if intrapleural pressure falls to minus seven, the alveolar pressure is minus two. So somewhere along the airway, the pressure will be between minus two and zero. It's always zero at the mouth. So let's take halfway along here somewhere, it doesn't matter particularly. Here the pressure is say minus one centimeter of water. So what's the pressure across the airway? Well, it's six centimeters of water holding the airway open. In other words, it's, you've got minus seven outside, minus one inside, holding the airway open. And incidentally, I should have pointed out that pre-inspiration, the difference in pressure across the airway is plus five centimeters of water. And by the way, we're assuming here that the pressure around the airways is the same as intrapleural pressure. Not absolutely accurate, but close enough for our purposes. So during inspiration, the airway is pulled open even more. Let's look now and see what happens at the end of inspiration. Now at the end of inspiration, of course, there's no airflow. We've stopped inspiring. And so the pressure at the mouth is atmospheric and the pressure in the alveoli is atmospheric as well. Pressure along the airway is all atmospheric. The pressure in the intrapleural space will be more negative, okay, because we've taken an inspiration and the recoil force of the lung is increased. And so now, look, we've got a pressure of eight centimeters of water holding the airway open. Now, the interesting events happen during the forced expiration. This subject is, is asked to make a sudden maximal expiration. His abdominal muscles contract uh, strongly and intrapleural pressure bumps up to plus 30 centimeters of water. Okay, now let's look and, and work out what the alveolar pressure is just at the beginning of the expiration here because we know that if he doesn't change lung volume, the transpulmonary pressure has got to be eight centimeters of water. The difference of pressure between the alveolar and intrapleural space has got to be eight centimeters of water. So now we can calculate that alveolar pressure is going to be 38 centimeters of water, okay? Somewhere along the airway, the pressure will be say plus 19. We're taking it halfway. Of course, the pressure at the mouth always is atmospheric. So here's the pressure is plus 19. Now there's a very interesting situation. The pressure outside the airway is plus 30. The pressure inside is plus 19. So we've got a pressure of minus 11 closing the airways. So we've got a pressure, it doesn't matter, but we've got a big pressure closing the airways, okay? The difference between plus 30 and plus 19 is closing the airways. Now we have a very interesting situation because these airways 
I say closing, I should have said collapsing the airways, because there is still some flow, but the airways are collapsed. Now, in this situation where the airways are collapsed, the pressure inside the airway is the same as the pressure outside, because these airways are not resisting collapse to any large extent, and so the pressure inside is 30 centimeters of water. So the pressure difference responsible to flow, for flow is not plus 38 minus zero, but it's plus 38 minus 30. So it's eight centimeters of water. So here we've got an interesting situation. If we try to exhale even more, increase our expiratory effort, we'll of course raise the intrapleural pressure but the alveolar pressure goes up by the same extent and the difference in pressure responsible for flow, which is plus 38 minus plus 30, that pressure difference is going to be constant. So this explains why the flow rate is independent of expiratory effort. Now does that remind you of anything? Of course it does. It reminds us of the flow rate in zone two of the lung, you remember. We have exactly the same kind of problem. And remember we described that using this model of two collapsible uh, tubes in pressure chambers here. Remember we said that if we have a collapsible tube here, but the downstream pressure exceeds the pressure in the pressure chamber, then flow is equal to the upstream pressure minus the downstream pressure. But if you've got a collapsible tube here in a pressure chamber where the pressure in the chamber exceeds the downstream pressure, then the collapsible tube will collapse. The pressure inside the, the tube at the point of collapse is equal to the chamber pressure. Flow is determined by the difference between the upstream pressure and the pressure here. And therefore, in the case of zone two, this is arterial pressure minus alveolar pressure, not arterial minus venous pressure. So exactly the same thing happens in, this, uh, in the lung under these conditions. And this is sometimes called the Starling resistor effect or the waterfall or the sluice effect. And it explains why the flow rate is independent of effort. It also explains why the flow decreases gradually over this period here because the flow rate with, with dynamic compression of the airways, which is what this is called, compression of the airways, the flow rate is caused by the difference between intrapleural and alveolar pressure. Or alveolar, and it, so it's alveolar pressure exceeds intrapleural pressure, and that's the pressure difference responsible for flow, and this gradually decreases, become long volume decreases, and that's why we get uh, flow decreasing down the lung. Now it turns out that this is a very important mechanism in patients with lung disease. Uh, you, there, are, there are at least three factors why a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease tends to exaggerate this mechanism of dynamic compression. One is that if there is an increase in resistance of these small airways near the alveoli, the small airways here, this is going to increase the rate at which the pressure is lost as we go up the airway, okay? As the resistance increases here, we'll lose the pressure more rapidly and therefore this compression point will occur earlier. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the consequences of this is that as you go from high lung volume to low lung volume, the point of collapse, sometimes called the equal pressure point, moves peripherally down the lung because of the increase in resistance of these small airways. So that's one factor because these patients with severe lung disease have an increase in the resistance of the small airways. They've lost a lot of their lung parenchyma, they've got holes in their lung, and they've also lost small airways, so they've got an increase in airway resistance. So this is an exaggerating factor. Another factor is that these patients with COPD have a an increased lung compliance. Now remember we talked about that briefly. That means that the difference 
between intrapleural and alveolar pressure is reduced in these patients. They've lost some of their elastic recoil because of destruction of the lung, of the lung parenchyma uh, and the architecture of the lung has been destroyed. And so the difference in pressure is less. And since the difference in pressure is responsible for flow, the flow rate is less. And finally, the radial traction on the airways is reduced in these patients. It turns out that the, because of the destruction of the lung parenchyma, destruction of the architecture, the tethering of the airways is not as strong as it is in the normal lung. The airways don't have the radial traction they should, and therefore they're more likely to collapse. So this is a very important mechanism in patients with severe lung disease. Now, I've been talking about airway resistance, and I should just mention another factor which goes along with airway resistance, and this is tissue resistance. Uh, tissue resistance uh, is like airway resistance. It's the resistance caused by the sliding of one tissue over the other as lung volume has changed. It's not as much as airway resistance, so we don't spend as much time on it, but we should just mention it. Now finally, I'm going to talk briefly about the work of breathing. And first of all, we'll look at the work done on the lung during breathing. How much work do we need to do in order to expand the lung? And work is often indicated as pressure times volume, and we can do that using a uh, um, image as shown here. Here we've got intrapleural pressure uh, on this axis, and this is volume above FRC as we expand the lung. As we expand the lung, of course, intrapleural intrapressure, uh, pressure falls, and if there was no airway resistance, the path would be along AEC here. In other words, the the, uh, the, this would be determined by the compliance of the lung. As the volume increased, the pleural pressure would fall. And if there was no airway resistance, the work done on the lung would be indicated by the area of this trapezoid, uh, 0, A, E, C, D, 0 here. That would be the, the work done expanding the lung. Because there's airway resistance, however, the intrapleural pressure falls somewhat below what you would expect if there were no resistance, and so the curve goes up here, and the shaded area indicates the additional work done on the lung because of the airway resistance. In other words, the total resistance then, the total work done on the lung would be 0, A, B, C, D, 0 here. So that's the work done inspiring the lung, in, in, inspiring in the presence of airway resistance. Now what about expiration? Well, on expiration, of course, intrapleural pressure falls, and if there was no uh, resistance, airway resistance, it would fall along this uh, line here, CEA. But because there is airway resistance, the intrapleural pressure uh, falls along this line here, and the work done, uh, which is indicated in this segment here. Now you can see that this work falls within the trapezoid here, and so no external work is needed for, for expiration under normal conditions. The uh, work done overcoming the resistance of the airways is provided by the elastic recoil pressure of the lung. What about the total work of breathing? Well, it turns out that the oxygen cost of breathing under normal conditions is very small, very difficult to measure, actually. Sometimes can be measured during anesthesia, for example. But the total work of breathing is difficult to measure. But under normal resting conditions, it's very small in a normal subject. It increases on exercise, of course, because we're making much greater respiratory efforts. Lung volume is changing more airway resistance, the work done in overcoming the resistance of the airways is greater because flow rates are high. But in the normal subject during work, uh, the 
work done on the, uh, the, the work of breathing is relatively small. Not so in patients with lung disease. In patients with lung disease, where the airway resistance is greatly increased, the work of breathing can be very substantial. And in fact, some patients uh, find it very difficult to increase their ventilation because the amount of oxygen they require because of the increased work of breathing uh, is as much as they get from increasing their ventilation. So these patients are limited by the work of breathing. So now let's summarize some of the points we've made in the, uh, this second session on mechanics. Uh, we, we're dealing mainly here with airway resistance, a very important topic because so many patients with lung disease have an increased airway resistance. And to consider that, we first looked at the mode of airflow through tubes. We looked at laminar flow, transitional flow, and turbulent flow at very high flow rates. We pointed out that during laminar flow, according to the French physician Poisset, the resistance is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius. It's a very important finding because uh, this means that in a patient, for example, with asthma, where the airways perhaps are, are reduced to half their normal di diameter, which can certainly occur, the resistance in those airways increases 16-fold. That's 2 to the power 4, 16-fold. So a small decrease in airway caliber can be responsible for a very large increase in airway resistance. We talked about briefly, we mentioned Reynolds' number, which indicates when we're likely to get turbulence. And we went on to say that probably in most of the lung, flow is transitional, uh, because partly because of the numerous branches within the lung. You don't get pure laminar flow, you get transitional flow. But probably in the very smallest airways, where the Reynolds number can be as low as one in the very smallest airways, uh, flow is truly laminar. But probably in the trachea, particularly on exercise, uh, flow is almost certainly turbulent. We then went on to the pressures in the breathing cycle, which is very important to understand what's going on in the lung during breathing in terms of pressure and flow. And we pointed out that uh, we can easily uh, draw the changes in lung volume. The changes in flow rate will reflect the changes in lung volume, of course. In fact, flow is simply the differential of the volume change. We then said that alveolar pressure is going to, to reflect the flow rate if the resistance of the airways is normal, is, is fixed, is constant during inspiration, as it very nearly is during normal tidal breathing. And then we went on to look at the intrapleural pressure, which is a more complicated thing. And we pointed out that the intrapleural pressure falls during inspiration for two reasons. One is that as you increase the volume of the lung, the recoil pressure of the lung increases, and therefore intrapleural pressure has to fall. But in addition, as you inspire, alveolar pressure falls, and so intrapleural pressure falls by the addition of the recoil pressure and the fall in alveolar pressure. We then talked about factors determining airway resistance. We pointed out that in spite of what you might expect, the small airways of the lung do not contribute most of the resistance. And, and the reason for that surprising finding is that there are so many of them. And so they're all in parallel. And although each airway itself has a high resistance, there are so many of them that the resistance in the smallest airways is very small. And this constitutes a silent zone, which means that it's difficult to pick up changes in resistance in the small airways. And that's a pity because we would like to be able to do that in early lung disease, but it's difficult to do because the intrinsic resistance of that region of the lung is so small. We talked about the factors determining airway resistance. Lung volume is important. As we increase lung volume, we increase the radial traction on the airways and uh, the caliber increases, just as is the case with the extra alveolar blood vessels, remember, we talked about. We pointed out that the, the, the smooth muscle in the airways, the bronchial smooth muscle, is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Uh, 
and with uh, beta adrenergic receptor uh, uh, agonists, we can dilate the airways. And what I forgot to say, I might say, is the reverse is true also. If we stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, if we use a drug like methacholine, we can, uh, we can cause the airways to contract. Uh, and that's important. That's sometimes used in some patients when we want to determine uh, whether the airways are sensitive or not, uh, hyperreactive as they are in some patients with asthma. Sometimes we give a small dose of methacholine and look to see how much the resistance increases. We also mentioned reflex effects. For example, very important example, if you take up single puff of a cigarette, you can increase the resistance of the airways, it's been shown. And we also pointed out that the density of the gas is important. For example, a diver who goes down to a great depth uh, finds it very difficult to breathe because the density of the air is so high that the resistance to breathing is very great. And that's one of the reasons why divers use a helium oxygen mixture, professional divers use a helium oxygen mixture because that reduces the work of breathing. We then went on to this very important topic of dynamic compression of the airways. And we showed the flow volume curve and pointed out that in the expiratory limb of the flow volume curve, it's very difficult to change the flow rate. And so experimentally, flow becomes independent of effort. And we went on to show these iso volume pressure flow curves. And the point of those is that if you look at a particular volume of the lung, say low volume of the lung, as you measure from a series of expirations, plotted against intrapleural pressure, what that shows is that no matter how much you raise the intrapleural pressure by making an increased expiratory effort, you can't increase the airflow. And that's a very important factor uh, in, in lung disease because many patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are greatly disabled by this this mechanism of dynamic compression of the airways. They just cannot increase their ventilation where they try to exercise and therefore their uh, mobility is greatly reduced. We mentioned three factors in COPD that exaggerate the dynamic compression. One is the fact that the small airways have a, um, a, a, a lost in COPD and, and that exaggerates the dynamic compression. Another was that compliance of the lung is increased in many of these patients. And since the difference between alveolar and intrapleural pressure is what's responsible for the flow, then uh, that's an important factor. And finally, we pointed out that radial traction on the airways because of the lung disease, the destruction of the architecture, means that the airways collapse more easily. So it's a very important uh, problem in patients with COPD. We mentioned briefly tissue resistance, which is like airway resistance, except that it's caused by the sliding of tissues over each other. Uh, we should just mention that. Uh, and finally, we talked about the work of breathing. We analyzed briefly the work done on the lung, showed that during expiration, the work done overcoming resistance uh, can be accounted for by the elastic recoil of the lung. The lung has stored energy in it, and so you don't have to make an expiratory effort. Normally, uh, during tidal breathing, of course, expiration is passive, and that's the reason. And then finally, we mention the total work of breathing, which in normal subjects is small uh, at rest and not great even during exercise. Increases, of course, but with moderate exercise, not particularly great. But with patients with lung disease, the work of breathing can become very high because of the increased airway resistance. And this is an important factor in limiting their exercise ability. So that concludes our discussion of the mechanics of breathing. Hope to see you next time.